Hi everybody, welcome to the Designer Notebook series. This is the first vlog in my Designer Notebook series and it's for my very first ever design, which is the Beach Hut Socks. My name is Zoe. You can find me on Ravelry and on Instagram as Pins and Needles UK. Um, if you want to get in touch, do send me a direct message or you can email me hipinsandneedlesuk at gmail.com. Now, um, thank you first of all to anybody who has already bought my socks pattern. I was completely gobsmacked <laughs> at how many copies sold. It really has been a huge surprise and I'm massively grateful to everybody who, um, who's bought a pattern, so thank you very much. Um, and also to anybody that's bought any of the kits that Jenny from Owl About Yarn put up for sale on her Etsy shop as well. I wanted to start by just explaining a little bit about what I'm going to do in my designer notebook series. I was always curious about the process of knitwear design. Um, I wasn't really quite sure how the magic happened. And originally I had never planned on releasing any knitting patterns or designing anything at all. Um, and I'll talk a little bit in a moment about how I got into it in the end. But I found the process fascinating. It was really interesting to me how I had to go about it, what I found easy, what I found challenging, where I found support and information. So I documented it all. And I thought that maybe you guys might be interested to see how you get from an initial idea to a finished knitting pattern design. So I can only tell you my experiences, and as I've said, I've only got one pattern released so far. <laughs> so perhaps as time moves on, my process will change, um, and that will be interesting to, to follow as well. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take you through the entire design journey from start to finish, um, and I will make sure that I tell you all of the resources that I used, all of the places I found help, and I will, of course, make sure that I put links and notes for absolutely everything in the drop down box. Um, if any of you have any questions at the end of this, do please send me an email or earburn me on Ravelry. I'm very happy to answer questions. Um, I'll either get back to you directly or I might cover those questions in my next podcast. So, I've been knitting for several years, probably eight years or so. And as it became less of a hobby and more of an obsession. <laughs> my husband Dave used to ask me, oh, do you, think, do you think you fancy having a go at designing? And I always said, no, definitely not. Um, we've got kids and our own business. I'm very busy indeed. And for many years, all I wanted from knitting was an escape. I wanted to escape the chores and the to-dos and all the rest of it. And I liked I liked having a pattern that someone else had written and I enjoyed not having to make decisions because it was all written out. You know, there were so many wonderful patterns out there. You could just pick one, start knitting and that was it. And for a long time that satisfied every creative urge that I had and that was wonderful. And then over time, um, I became slightly more involved in the Yarny world Ravelry became a much more important part of my life and, and I found some people on there who have become firm friends, very important to me and we've met in real life. Um, as I'm sure you know by now, I am excellent friends with Jenny of Owl About Yarn and also Ellie of Tuthin Brim. And they are all, they are both a little bit further ahead of me in this process. They've been dyeing their own yarns for years They've both got several patterns up on Ravelry that have had hundreds of downloads each. Um, and so through Jenny and Ellie, I became slightly more drawn into the Yarny community. And then I started helping Jenny at the yarn festivals that we went to. And it, as I'm sure you all, you all know, the, the knitty community or the crafty community as a whole is just such a wonderful place full of the best kind of people. And although it is a business environment, there are a lot of people who make money and make a living out of that world, there was no ill will, there's no bad feeling. 
you know, officially a yarn festival is full of competitors and they're all after the same money from the same people that walk in the door on that day. But you would never know it. The camaraderie, the support, the encouragement and the help that all of the vendors give each other and just seeing people meet at these events. It was such a wonderful place to be and I wanted to be a part of that. I have approximately zero skills at dyeing, so there was no way I was going to set myself up as a rival to Jenny. Um, and basically, I had a desire to become further involved in the community, but I wasn't sure how I was going to make that happen. And then one day I went to knit night and Jenny had ordered some Aramite yarn to have a go at dyeing some of that for her shop to see if it would sell. So she'd been experimenting with some new colourways and she very kindly gave me for free one of her experimental yarns. So she was trying to sort of nail down some particular colours um, and this was one of her first iterations. Um, so she gave me this for free. Now this is Happy Owl Aran. 100% superwash blue faced Leicester. 100 grams gives you 166 meters, 181 yards. And this colorway she called Fast Lane. And she took that from a, um, a Keris Matthews pop song, which if you're Welsh, you'll know Keris Matthews. Um, so she very kindly gave me a single skein of Aaron. And it made me realize that very few indie dyers carry heavier weight yarns. They all do fingering, lots do lace weight, you find the occasional bit of DK, very few of them do Aran. And I thought that was a shame. I know a lot of people say, well, you, you know, you can just buy one skein of sock yarn and you can get a whole project out of it. And yes, you can. But one skein of Aran, that's a hat, that's mittens, that is a sleeveless vest for a baby. There's so much you can do with a single skein of Aran. And I thought, I wish more indie dyers did that. Maybe, maybe I could come up with some designs for single skeins of Aran weight. And basically, that's what sparked my design ideas. Now, I live on Barry Island, which is right on the coast in South Wales. And once I'd had this initial idea of wanting to become more involved in the community, and once I'd found the medium I thought I wanted to work in that could be my niche, I was, I kind of, I suppose I was ready for inspiration to hit me. Um, and I have a dog, Jim the dog, lovely black Labrador. He's just out of shot down there. And, um, I spend a lot of time walking Jim the dog around Barry Island, which is where we live. And I've been walking Jim for, well, he'll be five this August. So I've been walking Jim the dog around the same island for five years. And it wasn't until I'd had the immersion in the community, um, the prompt of the skein of yarn from Jenny, and the desire to take things a little further, that inspiration found me on the dog walk. And I suddenly had a, literally an idea for an entire collection just went pop right into my brain. And I can't tell you the details of it because I'm gonna publish these patterns when I've got around to writing them. So I can't give you any sneak peeks really. Um, but it just hit me. I suddenly had three or four ideas of patterns I could make out of heavier weight yarn that were connected to where I live. And I love where I live. It's so much a part of me and my family and my life that connecting my love of knitting and my love for the community and my love of Barry Island, it was just the perfect storm of ideas. So I started thinking about how I could turn this into reality. And this was probably November or December of 2017, um, which was getting a bit late in terms of giving myself time to write various knitting patterns, three or four designs up and get it published. I'm thinking, well, I'm going to be coming out of spring and into summer by that point because I'm new and it will take me so much time. And 
I didn't think that publishing a collection of knitting patterns, which would obviously be a higher price, because it would be three or four patterns, was a great first project for a brand new designer. I thought, well, who's going to take a risk on paying maybe, I don't know, say £10 for four patterns from a designer with no history whatsoever? I thought that might be a bit risky. So one of the ideas I had had was for a motif, um, a colour work design, that I hadn't decided on the object to put it in. I knew I wanted a beach huts pattern, but I wasn't sure what it would go on. So what I decided to do was design a sock. I love knitting socks. Everybody loves knitting socks. There's a huge desire for sock patterns. So I thought, okay, well, knit a do a, a colourwork sock pattern with your beach huts and release it as a single pattern and get that out for summer. So I would have learnt the process, I would have found my resources and it will be a nice easy introduction between the two of us and then I can release my larger collection at the end of 2018, late autumn I'm hoping for. And that will be a way of easing me in. So as I said, this is my beach hut sock pattern um, and it is in Owl About Yarn, custom dyed in the colourway Overcast for the main colour and then these are some of her Sparkle Rainbow Minis. Um, she has got some available in her shop, she's dyeing some up now and she is releasing some more kits um, for the yarn and some stitch markers and the pattern as well. There are links to her Etsy shop down below. So what I wanted to do was insert here a little clip that I took of me walking along the seafront of Barry Island so you can see the actual beach huts and the part of the island that inspired this design. So I will hand you over to past Zoe and then you can come back and join me in a minute for the next section. So after I'd had my initial idea um, Jenny and I were soon after that off up to Edinburgh. Oh, you can just see Jim. I think you saw a bit of Jim just down there. <laughs> um, we were heading up to Edinburgh for the Edinburgh Yarn Festival and it was the first time either of us had gone. We were very excited um, and my plan was to make my purchases directly connected to the collection that I wanted to release in the autumn. Um, I, I knew I had my beach hut socks designed to work on, but I was planning on getting the yarn from Jenny. Um, so I wanted to take the Edinburgh opportunity to just look at all the other indie dyers, have a proper squish, um, and really find some interesting Aran weight yarns that I could use for the design. So although this video is about the socks, I was going to briefly show you the yarn that I bought from Edinburgh just to be part of the process. So given that I had, um, I had a couple of fully formed ideas and a couple of stitch pattern ideas, so I wanted to get a different range of yarns and colours to work in. Um, this yarn is Old Maiden Aunt and it's 100% Superwash Blue Face Lester Aran and it's in the colourway The White Hair. So this is a lovely, plump, squashy two-ply yarn um, in a sort of a marbly tonal grey. Um, I stopped off at the Triskelion Yarn and Fibre and bought a skein of their Elmet Aran. This is 75% Blue Face Leicester and 25% Masham. Um, and in the colourway, I don't know how you pronounce this, it's spelt A-O-D-H. And it's this lovely, it's looking a little purple there, but it's a beautiful sort of cornflower blue. And then I stopped off um, at the Midwinter Yarn Stand to see Estelle, a friend of mine. And she was releasing her first ever batch of hand-dyed yarn. Um, and it's called Black and Blue by Midwinter Yarns. And it's 100% Welsh wool. It's Blue Face Leicester and black blue face Leicester. It's a DK weight. And I bought this skein of sort of indigo purple. This is called Wizard's Hem. And then this gorgeous 
mustard, sort of dirty gold, is called Eternal Dalek. I wasn't sure if I wanted to use those two together um, or separately. Um, I think they're going to be separate now. So when I was thinking about my collection, excuse me, scrabbling around on the floor, these are the yarns that I decided was going to be my working palette. And I could see all of these colours in Barry Island on my dog walk. So, I mean, as it happens, um, with the exception of the old maiden aunt, all of the rest are Welsh. So I've got the Welsh blue face Leicester, I've got hand dyed in Wales owl about yarn, and um, Triskelion is a Welsh based company as well. So I really felt that was a good starting point. Um, Another resource that I stumbled upon in Edinburgh completely by accident was a fantastic book. I can't remember the name of the stand, but as you came in through the main doors, it was literally on your right hand side. It had loads of needles, loads of books. And the book I found was this. Um, it's the Beginner's Guide to Writing Knitting Patterns by Kate Atherley. And it's published by interweave.com. Um, and it is a, <laughs> she takes you through step by step every single part of the process. Um, it's, and you can see I've got um, markers in for all the bits I used. And again, I can't show you the details of it because it's a page for pattern, but if I show you the contents page, you can really see how thorough this book is. Um, and I found it an invaluable resource and I read the whole thing cover to cover. And then as I was going through the designing and publishing process, I frequently referred back to it. So if you are interested in designing your own work and publishing it, or if you've already done it, it is a super fantastic resource. Um, and I really enjoy the layout. Um, it's a nice funky layout, really clear and easy to read. So that was also an Edinburgh purchase. I think it says on the back, $27.99 US dollars. I think I paid £20 for it. Um, probably they have it on Amazon as well. So that was my initial purchase. Um, again, because I still had the whole collection in my mind, um, I wanted some stitch dictionaries and other resources. Jenny very kindly lent me a couple of hers just to have a look at and a flick through to see if I wanted them. So i've got such a pile of stuff to show you these are the ones i ended up buying cast on and bind off and this is by leslie ann bestor i've shown this on the podcast um so i won't take you through it in detail but it's spiral bound oh, perfect and um the layout lots of lovely clear photos so cast on bind off um, in the same format and layout with the spiral bound is Increase Decrease by Judith Durant. Um, and again, spiral bound, same lovely clear photographs. And then for an actual stitch dictionary, I was spoilt for choice. There are, of course, the classic Barbara Walkers, um, the Treasury of Knitting Patterns. I think there's three or four volumes of that. Um, but one of the ones that Jenny had, I immediately spotted three or four stitch patterns that I really felt would work for my collection. And it's this one. It's the Up Down All Around Stitch Dictionary and it is by Wendy Bernard. Wendy Bernard. Barnard. Wendy. Wendy wrote this. And again, it's in a hardback spiral bound. And again, the layout's fantastic. Um, what's that? $29.95 US dollars, $18.99 British pounds. Fantastic. And I love, you know, the whole point of this one is that for every stitch pattern, they give you a sample photograph of the swatch and they write it out in chart and written form but for both flat and knitting in the round and knitting it top down and bottom up. So fantastic book. I may well add to my collection with some of the Barbara Walkers, but this was enough to get me going. So I had piles of yarn, I had stitch dictionaries and book resources. Next, I actually needed to start 
knitting the socks. So um, I sent Jenny a photograph of the beach huts and I asked her to dye me up some yarn. And so she did. I asked her, she dyed several skeins and she gave me two, well I bought two. Um, I only used part of one. So this is Cuddly Owl Sock by Owl About Yarn. 75% superwash merino, 25% nylon. 100 grams gets you 425 meters, which is 464 yards. And it's in the colorway Overcast. Now she also sold me a pack of minis. Um, and it's a pack of seven 10 gram minis. I didn't need all of the colours, I knew which colours I wanted. Hang on a sec, they're still in the bottom of my knitting bag. So, I hope I'll be able to show you these without them exploding everywhere. So these are the colours of the mini skein pack. Now as you can see, I used these four, and these I haven't yet touched. Um, I just wound them up by hand. They don't have particular names. It is just the rainbow, sparkle rainbow mini skein pack. Um, and I've just kept these to one side. I might put those in my scrappy blanket. These are the four I was going to use for my design. And in the gray, I had the color of the concrete floor or indeed an overcast sky, which we get a lot of. And I felt that these would look fantastic. They'd really pop against that neutrally color. So that's what I started with. Now I don't know about you, but when I start a project, I like to have stationery. <laughs> so as well as assembling my resources um, and materials, um, I felt the need for a new notebook. So I didn't do anything fancy, but when I went to the supermarket for my next weekly food shop, I bought myself an A4 pucker pad. Um, I do like spiral bound and it had nice thick plastic covers on it and I like the fact it had tabs down the side as well. I wasn't sure if I would start work on lots of designs at the same time or if I'd pick one and finish that and then start the next. In the end that's how I did it um, but yeah I bought myself one of these. I also bought some colouring pencils because I knew that there'd be some colour work designs in this um, I wanted to make sure I could play around with the colours. I know you can do it on the computer, but I'm really not terribly good and I quite like colouring in. So that's what I did. I also bought some different coloured ballpoint pens, which I haven't even opened. Um, and that was enough to get me going. Oh, and post-it notes, but look, <gasps> rainbow colours. <laughs> I don't think I've actually used these yet. They're just really pretty and I like them. So I bought some post-it notes. Um, so that's everything that I found to get me going and my plan for actually knitting the design was to just cast on for my size. I always do a 72 stitch sock um, on a 2.25 millimetre needle um, and I just wanted to start knitting and write it down as I went. So the first thing I did before I actually started the knitting was I kind of had like an inspiration page, first page of my notebook. So I just, I roughed out the sock and added some notes to it, sketched out some rough designs and a colour scheme. And you can see I thought of a couple of different variations of them. Um, so I knew roughly where I wanted to go. Um, and because I was often designing these in sort of a grabbed half an hour here and there or a snatched evening, um, I wanted to be able to have everything written down in one place. And then I worked a little bit more on narrowing down the Fair Isle design. So this is a fairly simple zigzag pattern and all I did was add a couple of stitches underneath to do the beach hut doors and then some stripes. Um, now. For those of you who are familiar with the pattern, you'll see that on the drawing, the stripes are only one row. And on here, they ended up being two, just to give you a little bit more depth of colour. So I, I roughed out this, the Fair Isle pattern 
I tried a couple of different colour options and decided the one that I liked the most. And then before I broke into my good yarn, I made myself a little scrappy version. And this is it. So all I did was raid my scraps jar. And this is some grey Regia um, leftover sock yarn from some of Dave's old socks and scraps out of my jar. I can't even remember what the others are. No, I can't remember. And I swatched flat. So I did that trick of looping the yarn around the back so that you don't have to cast on a whole 64 stitch sock. And uh, I stuck with the two by two rib and I knit the beach huts and I realized then that the stripes weren't thick enough. So I ripped it back out and put in double stripes and it looks much better. So I knew that although I would end up possibly using different colours, because obviously the yarn would be different, I knew that it looked enough like beach huts to work um, and I felt that I'd got the size of the stripes right, that kind of thing. So I was ready to cast on. And then all I did was knit and write it down as I went. So I ended up with several pages I've done it all in pencil because there was much rubbing out and scratching and working out of numbers. Here we are onto the decreases. And one of the interesting things was how hard it was to write down and explain something that you do without thinking. I have knitted enough socks to know my own numbers and my own preferences. I don't even have to think about it, but I couldn't sell a pattern without explaining every step. So although knitting the socks was easy, doing the writing bits was really quite hard. Um, so once I had my finished design, I had my first attempt at actually writing up the pattern. So I'd taken my handwritten notes and I got myself a pint of tea and I sat in front of the laptop and tried to write it up. And um, I hadn't taken the photographs quite yet, so I took, um, I took a photograph of the finished socks and just sort of put it in as a placeholder and, uh, and started writing it up. And it was quite revealing. It's, it's much harder to explain something that you do without thinking. Um, and, but by the end of it, I was really quite pleased. I thought I'd made a decent job of it. I thought the sock looks nice. Jenny and Ellie thought it looked all right as well. And this is what I ended up with. So this is my first draft. Um, and there's some details on there from the tech editing, which I'll speak about at the moment. But so yes, for those of you who have already bought the pattern, you'll be able to see a big difference. So I'll show you a before. Here's the before and here's the after. Sorry, this one's laminated. <laughs> So you can see, hopefully, how, how much more professional the final version looks. Now, tech editing is something I did want to talk a little bit about. Um, I didn't know very much about tech editing at all, or about the business side of the crafty world. Um, and there are a couple of people that Jenny introduced me to, well, one she actually introduced me to, and one she just told me about, um, and they are Jolie Kelly, um, uh, she is JolieCreates.com and the other is Tara Swiger, who is TaraSwiger.com. I have mentioned them on previous podcasts, but basically those two ladies are, um, their business is helping crafters and artists to run their business as well. Um, and both of them produce an enormous amount of free content on their YouTube channels. Um, I'll leave links down below. Um, and as well as Jolie's YouTube channel, she also has the Woolly Hub on Facebook. Um, so yeah, both ladies are incredibly generous with their free content. And I've watched an awful lot of their seminars and um, podcasts and looked at their websites and things like that. Now, um, Jolie in particular does a tech editing course, which you can access through her website, so go there if you're interested. But she also did a live webinar on tech editing from the designer's point of view. 
how to use a tech editor, how to make the process as smooth as possible. Um, so I watched that and took a huge amount of notes. <laughs> um, and it turns out that a friend of mine, again, who I knew through Jenny, had taken that course recently and was trying to set herself up as a tech editor. Now that is the very lovely Maria. Hi Maria. Um, I met Maria, as I said, through Jenny and we actually got to meet in person um, on the Great London Yarn Crawl that we went on in 2017. And, you know, we comment on Instagram and things like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I was a new designer, Maria was a new tech editor, um, and so she kindly agreed to tech edit my sock pattern. Now, this was my first pattern, but I was reasonably confident that I'd done a, a decent job and I thought, well, there's probably going to be a few things that Maria finds that I've missed. I had no idea how valuable Maria's input would be to my pattern. Um, I gave you a brief look at the annotated pattern earlier, and I don't want to show you too much of it because it is Maria's work as well as mine, but a quick flash, and you can see the sort of the concentration of annotations um, that she added to my PDF document. Um, so tech editors in general, and Maria in particular, are worth every penny, <laughs> basically. Um, so basically I sent my PDF to Maria um, and she annotated it, sent it back along with a, a lengthy email um, and she, the sorts of things she found were um, any inconsistencies in punctuation, she looked for factual errors to do with the mathematics, um, sort of quest, uh, things to do with style and layout as well. So I then updated the pattern um, and at that point I felt it was ready to go to test knitting. So tech editors do not usually knit the actual item, they just go through the written pattern. So once I had polished it up and made huge improvements, thanks to Maria's kind work, um, I then went to my monthly thread and Ravelry and sent up a flare for some test knitters. And I was incredibly lucky that several of them volunteered. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, basically I, I ran all the test knitting through Ravelry. We just set up a thread. Um, part of the webinar of Jolie's that I... Um, it wasn't, it wasn't Jolie's webinar. Somewhere on Ravelry to do with test knitting, um, I found some guidelines. I think it might have been in the testing pool group. They have a sort of a guidelines page to help you set out clear expectations between you and your test knitters so that when you put a call out for test knitters, they can go and see a detailed list that covers things like the materials they, they will need and who will supply them any deadlines that need to be met, any requirements you have regarding pattern pages or tags, whether you're happy for them to put it on social media, all sorts of things like that. So again, I'll try and find that on Ravelry and link to it down below. So I read that post, got the testing thread set up and then emails all my test knitters the pattern. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I, I mentioned to them if there were any particular areas I wanted them to have a careful look at some of them came back to me and said, do you mind if I make these slight alterations? Um, one lady has a high instep, so she wanted to know if she could knit the heel flap longer than I'd stated in the pattern. Um, and I said, yes, that's fine. Um, but once you get to the number of rows that I stated, could you please just double check at that point, but then carry on. So, so that was the, uh, the test knitting process. Um, and they picked up a few things that Maria and I had missed. Um, and they suggested rewriting re one particular part of the pattern. So, you know, a vast improvement on version one after tech editing and another huge improvement after the test knitting process. Um, the end of that process meant that I had a pattern that I was confident would look professional and that I could feel good about charging people for money for because it was well written, 
well edited, well presented. Um, and I even asked my test knitters, I was so undecided on what price to put on it. Um, and I said to them, you know, do you think it's worth, you know, four pounds? Um, obviously it's four pounds plus VAT if you're in the European Union. So there was a bit of advice, you know, they were fantastic and a really supportive bunch of ladies. So I ended up with this. So this is my beach hut socks pattern. This is the front cover. Um, now you can see I managed to take some more photos. If you go and have a look on the project page, um, the pattern page on Ravelry, um, you can see the rest of the photos. And the photo shoot was another bit of a, uh, bit of a learning curve. Um, I went down to the, the beachfront with Dave and I had um, obviously the socks on their sock blockers. We had my phone. I used my Samsung to take the phone pictures. Um, and I had a sun hat and some sunglasses in case I wanted props. I don't know. And Barry Island is super busy. So there were a lot of people. And there was me reclining <laughs> against a beach hut. Oh, God. Trying to do relaxed model poses. It was really awkward really awkward anyway dave took a load of pictures like four or five dozen some portrait some landscape close-ups action shots detail shots all sorts of things so thank you to dave for helping with the photos um, and those are the ones that i used both in the pattern for any marketing on instagram um, and actually for going up on ravelry as well um so I ended up with a pattern that I was very happy with. Um, I used the Ravelry's own wiki pages for how to upload your patterns onto Ravelry. It's not, it's not a difficult process, but there's a lot of steps to it. So you just need to make sure you go through them all um, and you have to upload your, you have to add your pattern to the Ravelry database, which is just filling in a, an online form. And then once you've done that, then you upload the PDF. And once that's done, then you go and sort of link that pattern to your Ravelry profile. Um, if you look in your notebook down the, the side where you've got sort of stash and library and things like that, there's a button that says contributions. So you can click in there and sort of set up your Ravelry designer store and then link your pattern to the store. So it was a, a bit convoluted, but I worked my way through it. it. It wasn't a problem. And then there's a tab in there where you can set up promotion codes. Now, I have run my own business for 11 years and I can safely say that marketing is not one of my strong suits. Um, I've never had any training in it. It doesn't come naturally to me. Plus I'm British. So blowing your own trumpet is absolutely mortifying. <laughs> but I really felt, I thought, come on, you've put all the hard work in, writing the pattern, you know, Jenny, bless her heart, she's been dying yarn. Dave took a million photographs. Everyone's been cheering me on. You've really got to do a proper job. And by happy accident, the very lovely Tara Swiger did um, a podcast, you can watch it on YouTube or you can listen to her um, through iTunes. Um, and it was episode 162 called How to Launch Your Next Product or Design. So go and listen to it because it's fabulous. It's simple, it's straightforward, she explains it all. And um, if any of you follow me on Instagram, you'll have seen what I did. All I did was put posts up, reminding people it was coming out um, I did sign up to a service called Linktree. So if you um, have a look in your Instagram profile, there's only space there for one link in your profile. Um, and I wanted a link to the pattern page. I wanted a, a link to sign up to my newsletter. I wanted um, a link to my Ravelry group. So if you sign up, if you just search in Google for Linktree, basically it's a way of taking people from your Instagram page to a little menu where you can have up to six direct button links, basically. You can see it if you go to my, my bio in Instagram. So I got all of that set up so that if people looked at my post and thought, yes, I want to buy that, they can click on my profile and they can click on a button that takes me right to the Ravelry page where they can pay and download. 
Um, Jenny also very kindly helped me set up MailChimp. So I had a MailChimp account. Um, and one of the things I did was say, if you sign up to receive my newsletter, you will get a discount code for the Beach Hut Socks pattern. And I think, I, I think I'm up to something like 55 subscribers to my newsletter in two weeks. Um, and I can see, if you go into the pattern sales bit of your shopkeeper's account on Ravelry, it will list every single pattern download and which of those were free patterns that I gifted to people, which of those were straight purchases from the pattern page and which were the newsletter downloads or the kit download codes that went with Jenny's yarn kits that she sold. So basically I listened to episode 162 of Tara Swiger's podcast and did what she said. It wasn't complicated, it was photographs on Instagram, it was shout outs in my podcast, that kind of thing. Um, something else that I've done is um, send free copies of the pattern out. I sent free copies to all of the test knitters. Obviously they had the first version um, and then when I'd made the corrections using their suggestions I then sent them the final final version as well. Um, I sent a copy to Jolie Kelly and to Tara Swiger just to say thank you very much for all your support even though you didn't know I was listening. Um, and I sent a copy out to some other podcasters as giveaways in their knit-alongs um, or just, to, just for a fun giveaway regardless. So that hopefully, as well as me promoting my own work, I'll reach other audiences through other podcasters. Um, and that's, that's the end of my process. I hope you found that interesting. It's A lot of it surprised me. Um, and I, as I said, I'll do some of these... I'll do one of these for every pattern that I release. I perhaps won't go into quite so much detail, but I will certainly take you around the, the places that inspire my design, talk you through my you know, actual design process itself. Um, and without turning this into some sort of terrible Oscar acceptance speech, <laughs> I would really like to say another enormous thank you. All my test knitters, Jenny and Ellie, my mum, Dave, who bless his heart, called it work from the start, even though it was actually knitting a sock. That was very kind. Um, and also to you, the people that watch my podcast, because wanting to spend more time with you and be a bigger part in the community that we all share in was one of the main reasons I did this. So thank you to all of you guys for your support. Thank you to anyone that bought the pattern. Um, as I mentioned, I will put links for all of the details down below. Um, if you enjoyed what you have seen please give me a thumbs up click subscribe um, and if you would like to knit yourself a copy of my beach hut socks there will be a link down below as well that will take you straight to the Ravelry pattern page thank you so much for watching and I will see you all soon bye